blah. We'll do that all over again. Entry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the MedTech Wealth Advisor podcast with your host, Matt Nelson. Matt, this is part two of estate planning. And for those of you who have not listened to part one, you can still listen to part two, but I would urge you to go back and listen to some of the things covered in part one as well, because it, it was a terrific conversation. And Matt, I'm looking forward to a continuation of, of that conversation, if you will. Yes, I, I really am too. And I'm, I'm glad to have uh, Jennifer Santini back with us and and uh, keep educating us. I learn something every time I talk to her. So you, even though I'm doing this all of the time with clients, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not an attorney. So that's why we bring professionals in to, yeah. to take care of you it. Know, well, I, to be honest with you, I learned some things in that last episode as well that I didn't know. So stick around, folks. Learn yes. some things. Yeah. So just as a, as a quick uh, recap, if you haven't heard the first episode, we, we wanted to talk about why you even need to be thinking about estate planning in the first place, you know, kind of unravel the the complication. It's not, it, it, it doesn't have to be made so complex of, you know, major wills and trusts and, and piles of documents. I mean, there's some just basics to put in place. Mm -hmm. And we talked about powers of attorney and healthcare directives and just basic beneficiary designations in the, in the first episode. But you know what, what that evolves into then as we'll, we'll uh, discuss is now we have to look at issues like taxes and what happens if you go to an, uh, a nursing home or, you know, why you should have a trust in place. We have a lot of clients with, um, th that are business owners that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have founded a med tech company, other, other businesses that gets a little bit more complex as well. Maybe, maybe assets in multiple States. So Jennifer, I'm just kind of unpacking mm -hmm. some of that for us, but uh, today let's let's just go kind of beyond the basics um yeah. and uh discuss what things like complex property might might sure. uh, do to your state plan when we want to mm -hmm. get a trust involved mm -hmm. um and you know we'll touch on a little bit of taxes and maybe some elder care planning at the end um so where do you sure. want to start you want to just sure. uh sure we can you know maybe just just sort of pick up you know, where we left off is we were talking about wills and the fact that it is important to have one because in the absence of a will, you're relying on the state to govern what happens with your assets. And so a common misconception that people will have is if I, you know, I need a will because I need to avoid, avoid probate, <clears throat> which for some people, if you're not aware of probate is the court process, it's having to go through the court process to get somebody appointed as the executor. Or again, in Minnesota, we refer to it as a personal representative. And so your will means that you get to be empowered to make those decisions versus relying on what the, the state says. We are fortunate here in Minnesota that probate's really not that bad, but there are other states where probate is not fun to go through. And again, I mentioned in the last episode, you know, California just happens to be one of those states. And so that's where you will start to see people consider utilizing other tools. And it may not even just be because of the state or because of going through the probate process, but there may be various other reasons to do with what we refer to as a living revocable trust. And so a living revocable trust, we refer to it as a will substitute. So that, you know, that really becomes your primary at death, you know, uh, estate planning document. Although the difference is that a living revocable trust does also provide some incapacity planning. Um, you know, we had talked about the power of attorney in the first episode, but with a trust, if you have assets in that trust and think of, I always, which I have right here, a vessel, a mug, or, you know, an entity where you're putting certain assets into that trust so that you don't really own them anymore. They're titled in the name of the trust. And if you became incapacitated, you will have named somebody to help oversee those assets still while you're living. But again, if you can't manage those assets. Sure. So can it, so a trust then could, could become the owner of just about anything you own, including businesses even? Yes. Yep. So for some business owners, like you had mentioned, the, you know, if they're the sole shareholder or they're, you know, the sole LLC member, they may assign or transfer their interest to the trust so that the trustee technically is now the owner of those. And they may do that during their lifetime, or they may do that at death. They may do what we refer to as a transfer on death designation of their, you know, 
uh, closely held corporate shares to say at my death, I want these shares to get transferred to my trust. And now I've named a trustee to oversee those, those assets for the benefit of my beneficiaries. Okay. So when, you know, when is it appropriate to start thinking about trust? You, you mentioned a couple things, but, but <laughs> why, why go to that extra work? Yeah. And I think that that's a great question because, you know, we do get a lot of clients that will come in and they'll say, I need a trust. And again, you will talk to different practitioners. They will approach things differently. There are some practitioners that use trust all the time. I think there are some practitioners that don't. And we at our firm, we really try to say, does it make the most sense? And so I sort of have a check the box, you know, of, of a few things that really sort of maybe sway me to utilize a trust versus not. Um, and one of the very first pieces is usually do the client's own assets outside of Minnesota. So we just talked about a business being put into a trust, but another main asset that you often see titled in trust is real property. So um, I think it is important to also take a moment to define what triggers probate. Um, and so my definition is that if you have a probate asset, it means it's an asset solely in your name at the time of your death, and there's no mechanism to transfer it. There's nobody that automatically falls into place to take ownership or control. And so, yeah, and so to, to define first non-probate assets, which a lot of the assets that you are dealing with, Matt, your retirement accounts, your life insurance policy, your brokerage accounts, or again, you guys, do you refer to them as TOD accounts? Right, um, transfer on death, exactly. Exactly. So at your death, they're already designated. They're already spoken for of what's going to happen to them. And for a lot of couples, they'll own a bulk of those types of assets, and then they'll own joint assets. So your joint bank account, your joint brokerage account, and again, assuming the home is jointly owned, when one person passes, the survivor, usually it's defaulting to the surviving owner. Mm -hmm. But now it's when somebody is the sole owner of real property. And maybe they're the sole owner of their house here in Minnesota, and they've got that second home in Arizona. Right. So, Classic so, snowbird scenario. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Probate in Minnesota is really not that bad. I do not want clients to have to go through it in two states. So that is typically where you're going to see a revocable trust make a, the most sense. Okay. I would also say there's two other like little check boxes. For me, it's if I know from an administration side. So you had mentioned, you know, learning things, you know, constantly when we talk. I learn something new every time I do an administration. So every time I do an administration, there's some little quirk that says, oh, this is why we should have, you know, it maybe should have been done this way or this in, you know, or years ago I had something. And so this is why I plan for it this way. And so if I know from the backside, it is going to be easier to do, um, to, to administer through a trust. Maybe you need a trust for long-term. Maybe you're wanting to do a trust for an adult child that has money issues um, and you're going to need to keep them the funds protected. Well, it's already in that structure. Um, blended families, I think is another big one. Second marriages, spouse one passes away. They want to provide for surviving spouse, but they want to be able to control what happens at surviving spouse's death. Um, having that trust structure can can really help. Okay, so it's so that's that's good clarification because I think a lot of times I'll, I'll uh, clients that talk to me get the impression that they have to have a, a very complex situation, right. millions and millions of dollars, and lots and lots of property. But I think right. what you're saying is, well, that is one reason. Yeah. But um, maybe they don't even have any uh, assets outside the state, but there's just there's enough complexity and enough. Uh, enough different wishes they have in the way that they want their assets to pass that yeah. uh, some administration would be easier yeah. with the trust. You know, Matt, I always, when I'm speaking for various seminars, I give a, an example of one of our mutual clients, which was a single gentleman owned a home. And I really thought a will, a will would be fine. And then he said, well, I would like to leave these 25 specific gifts to people and it ranged from like five thousand dollars to this person and a thousand dollars to this person and it was like Susie at the bar and you know the right. guy that I worked with and again we did it as a trust because it made it easier from an administration side versus when you go through probate 
all of those people would have had to be given notice about the proceeding. All of those right. people, we would have needed full legal names, addresses. And so again, we did it as a trust and it made it much easier to administer. So yeah, that's a fantastic example. I know exactly yeah. who you're talking about. <laughs> and it's 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 very it's fun to see because that's you know, uh, that that individual's wishes were carried mm -hmm. out. Yes. And um it didn't matter that the some of the gifts were relatively uh um, oh. relatively small, right? Correct. But, yes. But at the end of the day, uh this this person, you know, felt like during their lifetime they knew that the yeah. that what they had accumulated and saved the people that were important to them, they were going to be able to take care of in a way that, that mattered. Yes. And so that was, that's a great, yep. uh, yep. that's a great way to think about estate planning beyond just the mechanics of the law. It's yes. what, you know, it, is it, is it really uh, serving what your, what your wishes were? Right. Yeah. Very much so. Very that's much very so. Very good. Well, okay. So <laughs> Uh, let's touch. Let's maybe touch on taxes because um, yes. often I hear, "Oh, well, you just set up a trust so you can avoid paying taxes." That's that's the whole reason. Yes, yes. So there are what I would first like to explain is three different types of trust typically. So the first one is to understand is a trust that is not in effect today, but we might create down the road. And that is typically the one that we refer to as a testamentary trust, and it is commonly used for minor children. So in our last you know, episode, we referred to the fact that we don't want to leave minor children for a whole host of reasons. And we might not even want to leave young adult children, you know, your life insurance policies and your retirement accounts outright. And so, you know, setting up a trust under a structure, whether that's a will or a revocable trust, you know, is important to do. We just were starting to talk about these revocable trusts, and it's important for people to understand this revocable trust is a pass-through entity. So by putting assets in there, you are not sheltering it from creditors, from taxes. It's revocable. You have control to amend it, to modify it, to change it, to put assets in, take assets out. The other type of trust is use, uh, what we use is called an irrevocable trust. And we don't use them often. I mean, they, we really are very selective because you really have to go into it thinking, I can't touch this. I am getting money out of my estate. I am not going to have control over that. I'm not going to benefit from that. Um, and so you're right. I mean, clients will come in and they'll say, oh, my neighbor had this fancy. And I always say, if that really were the case, don't you think everybody would do that? Um, right. And so it's important to understand that particularly with the common use of a revocable trust is not going to avoid taxes. However, we can structure that trust in a way that we can build in tax planning. Um, and we can also utilize those trusts. And again, typically for dealing with spouses to possibly balance the estate. So we're already sort of separating um, the estate a little bit between the two spouses to maximize, you know, tax benefits. I think from the, the foundation to understand that there is a federal estate tax and that for various states, they have their own estate tax. And mm -hmm. most often these taxes are a tax on the value of the estate. It is not an inheritance tax. It's not a death tax. I always say, I don't even know really what that looks like, yes. but it's what is the value of your estate at your passing? And then it's a tax on that based on that value and whatever the laws are. That's so it's important. Good. Yeah. And it's important to understand the federal law, which I say, if this is a problem for you, it's a, sort of a good problem to have. It's over $13 million. So that means that you could have $13 million. You could pass away. And if you leave it to your children, there's not going to be an estate tax. Spouses can leave an unlimited amount to one another. So they don't have to worry about a state tax. But in a common scenario where you have a couple and one spouse passes and the survivor inherits everything and then they pass away and it goes to the kids, that's when the estate tax would be incurred. And so the use of a revocable trust can help possibly balance the estate between the two spouses. And then also we would draft some language where we can implement some strategies that upon the death of the first spouse, we're not commingling the two estates. Not mixing the two. Okay. Yes. So just to unravel that a little bit, I think I, you know, knowing that there's this roughly 13 million of of um yeah. 
I, I like we like to call okay. it a coupon. Like a, a it's it's sort of That's a coupon it? off. You don't get to yeah. you don't have to pay tax on the first chunk. Yeah. Um, but because each uh each person in the marriage gets yes. their portion, mm -hmm. that's I understand why it's best to plan ahead while you're both yeah. still alive so you can balance this estate. So you're talking about this yeah. balancing of the estate. Um, look, there's no taxes if the first one dies and you haven't done any estate planning, yeah. but you kind of wasted your coupon. Is, yes. that, is that right? Yes, because what ends up happening, and it is important to understand that for most states that have their own estate tax, it is usually significantly lower. So hmm. here in Minnesota, our threshold is $3 million. Whoa, significantly different. Significantly different. So for a lot of our clients, we're not really worried about the federal as much. It usually is we're dealing with the this Minnesota level. And I think it's also important for clients to know, again, you take a young professional couple, they've got young kids and they might think, oh, this wouldn't apply to us. They might be carrying large life insurance policies. Sure. Life insurance, it passes income tax free, but that value is calculated in the value of your estate. So you have one spouse that has a million dollar policy and another spouse that has a million dollar policy. That's in a combined estate, that's $2 million right there. And oh, people yeah. don't think about that. Um, and so there are rules that when the first spouse passes away, where you can sort of implement some of these strategies and you, you sort of have to have it built into the plan. So you can make these elections and you can trigger that tax savings or, or um, sometimes it could even be tax deferral, meaning that maybe it's the fact that we're not paying tax upon the death of the first spouse, but there may still be tax upon the death of the second spouse, just depending upon the estate and the value. And again, the laws that are in effect at that time. That's really significant. I mean, $3 million in Minnesota, mm. that is not hard oh. to get to when you consider, like you just said, a little bit of life insurance yes. houses these days. It's it's oh, yes. not unheard of to have a million dollar house very easily these days, yes. um, just with real estate prices and, uh, and throw in a couple IRAs and there you go. So oh, yeah. well, I, I think a lot of clients don't really realize the, correct. The, the issue that they're at already. Um, I, and, and not just, maybe not just today, but when we're doing the planning, mm. um, you know, just helping yeah. people understand like, you know, you're maybe not there today, but based on what we're doing and the strategies mm -hmm. we have in place, it's just a few short years and this is going to be a problem. We need to plan. We need to get out ahead of it. A hundred percent. And, you know, we are always trying to say, we're trying to put a plan in that place that would grow with them. Because I also laugh that I'm a non-native Minnesotan, but Minnesotans are some of the most, I think, unassuming wealthiest people. I mean, they've worked really hard at these jobs. I mean, I've got clients that have, they're very loyal, you know, where the Twin Cities market has got great, you know, Fortune 500 companies that these people have worked at for a really long time. They have saved really well. They might have, you know, stock options that they've had from these companies. And so I, it's often that I have clients that come in and they'll say, we do not, we're not even anywhere close, but you start to talk with them and you start adding things up and they're going, oh, I guess we're in a better position than we thought we were. Um, yes. And so it is. And then, and then again, you've got clients that they might be addressing their estate plan for the first time because they're really more concerned about the guardianship nomination and protecting things for their minor kids, but they're going to grow, right? Their assets are going to grow. They're getting into their potential, you know, their high earning years, they're possibly going to get promotions or, you know, and right. so, yeah, you're wanting to put a plan that's somewhat flexible and will grow with them. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, you, you touched on there, the guardianship issues. Why don't we mm -hmm. kind of back up a second um, and, and talk about when there's minor children. And, yeah. and also I would say, I, I want to discuss um, maybe couples that don't have children. Yes. Or, or a single individual. When yeah. would, um, you know, maybe a corporate trustee come into place or someone that's not a sure. family member to help take sure. care of things? Sure. Yes. And actually, I think it was in the last episode that I had mentioned that, you know, sometimes it is the the single individual or the, the people that possibly don't have children that they can be sometimes the trickiest to plan for. I mean, I think us as parents, you know, you sort of have this default of, oh, gosh, well, if we're both gone, you know, everything's going to go to our kids. And it seems somewhat of that default. 
Um, but you know, with, with people that they're trying to figure out what do they want to do with their assets. Um, and so certainly if clients are thinking that they do want to possibly leave assets for maybe nieces and nephews, again, even though they're not your children, if they're minors, we got to protect those assets for them. And so making sure that we're, we're structuring that, that sense. Um, and then certainly it's, you know, when we are trying to decide who to name in some of these roles, I mean, I do spend significant time, even when I'm talking with parents and we're trying to address this with their, with regards to their own minor children, the trustee role to oversee assets for young children is a really, really important and um, particular role that you've got to give a lot of consideration because people are, you know, having a lot of discretion. And I, I think particularly as parents, when we are raising our kids, it's how are we raising our kids as it relates to values and money. Um, mm -hmm. And so you really got to make sure you've got the right people in place. But if you don't have somebody like that in your life, you may need to look to a professional to do that. Yeah. You know, it makes me think of a, a you know, a couple different stories, just client stories that we have, but mm -hmm. one in particular, and it's, it's just, it's unfortunate, but is a situation where there's my, minor children, parents passed away, large life insurance policy, mm -hmm no trust in place. Mm. So therefore, um, all the challenges that come with that, but more or less, just to simplify it, the, the assets, um, you know, we're putting an account for that child's benefit and fully available when that child turned 18. Mm -hmm. Now, yes. no matter how many times I tried to simplify it and talk to these under 18 year old kids, um, and help them understand a little bit about a, the compounding mo of money and how that worked. And even after they turned 18 yeah. and how they may not ever have to save for retirement again, if they would treat this correctly, <clears throat> how much do you think of that money oh, is left today? Not very much. Not uh, very much. As, as in zero. And it's just really, yeah. it's really unfortunate. It, it's, yeah. you know, this is, this is a key place. I think that, you know, a, a trustee, um, maybe not even a trustee from the family yeah. should be involved because if you're the aunt, you don't want to be the bad aunt who won't yeah. give your, your, you know, niece or nephew the money. And you can kind of put yeah. that off on someone else. Yeah. Yeah, no, very much. So I always say that because you want to, you want to preserve relationships for sure. And I always joke, money makes people funny. And I don't think that when you name the aunt to serve in that role, that they are trying to be mean by saying no, but they do exude a lot of discretion and a lot of judgment and what they think is appropriate or not. And so you can see where that power struggle really comes in. And there's a lot of times that they are so frugal, you know, they, that those, those purse strings are so tight and, you know, the beneficiary is going, this they, don't they don't want to mess it up. They don't want to mess it up. And they think that it's supposed to last, you know, in perpetuity is which that sometimes isn't always the case. Right. And so to your point, having that professional that knows how to structure it to say, okay, we're going to put these funds and this is the balance of how we're going to invest it. And we know if we only spend X of it, you know, we can still continue to, to make it grow and make it work for us. Um, and then they also can usually be the bad guys. They also can be the ones that have an easier time to say, nope, that's not really what this money is for. Or that's not how this, you know, the, the rules work. Um, yeah. And then certainly I think, you know, you started the conversation a little bit too, with regards to trust um, and clients that have unique assets. So there are some clients where if those business interests are going to stay in trust, I've had several clients where they do want their kids to have the option to possibly continue these businesses, um, but they might also not be of the age that they will be able to do it, you know, if the, if the parent passed right away. Um, and sometimes that's even just even, let's say, rental properties. And so possibly having professionals in place just based on what are the uniqueness of the assets that possibly are in the trust as well. Sure. Just to kind of bridge that gap until yes. they're, yeah. they're maybe responsible enough. Yeah, yes. that's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know we're getting closer on time, but I do want to kind of touch on um, a little bit around just maybe maybe what's referred to as elder care planning yes. or just kind of the planning toward the end of life. And, yeah. and maybe one of the first things I want you to to comment on is, is back to that idea of the couple without children and mm. maybe who doesn't have, um, well, let me back up, but, you know, today's age, um, 
people are living longer and longer, uh, much longer yes. than their parents. Yes. And I, you know, I'll see couples without children that are very healthy way into their eighties. They yes. might not have any other living relatives around. I know. Yeah. And there's some significant decisions to be made. So mm-hmm. how, how do, how do they kind of handle some of that? Um, you know, if maybe one of them is the primary financial decision maker and they're worried that, Hey, if I'm incapacitated, what happens to my, my yeah. spouse? That's not. Yeah. And it is, it is really hard. And I will say, Matt, I mean, I think that this is going to be an issue that more and more communities are going to face, which is there are not enough providers to sort of fill this gap, to fill that role. Um, You know, we were talking about sort of a corporate trustee or professional trustee, and a lot of times those are either associated with um, true uh, professional, you know, trust companies, or there's certain banks that have trust departments. Um, But to your point, sometimes it's needing more of that individual professional fiduciary to serve in some of those incapacity roles for these clients because they again they don't have anybody to name Um, and it is our huge huge struggle and so it takes a lot of sort of networking and talking to people to get those referrals and then you know when you sit down with clients to say okay you you might be that candidate to, to reach out but let's have that conversation and let's make sure that you feel comfortable with this person that is not related to you making some of these decisions. Um, You know, you started to touch about with regards to sort of that elder law planning, um, you know, that is a very, very unique area of the law. It's always, I always say we, I know enough about it, particularly here in Minnesota to be dangerous, but we, again, certainly those are things where we possibly refer out, um, particularly when that need is, um, is true. So I do think we get a lot of clients that will ask about it. And again, to your point, sort of about the taxes, I think it's the same thing. People will say, what do I do? Or how do I get rid of all of my assets? So that if I have a, you know, a tr- um, a long-term event, you know, and I need long-term care that the state isn't going to take all, you know, take all of my assets. Right. And it gets difficult. It really gets difficult because, you know, there are certain clients that I look at and I'd say, you're not going to qualify. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to self-insure or you're, and again, or you're going to be proactive and have a conversation and do you end up doing a true, you know, long-term care policy. Um, And then there are some clients where you, their, you know, net worth, it's going, it's going to get spent, you know, there's nothing at this point because you do have to be so proactive. Um, here in Minnesota, we refer to, uh, people will refer to as a look back period. So when people are starting to venture into the, the planning process, and again, there might be the desire and, and the advice to say, yes, we should give and get assets out of your estate so that you don't own them. But if you have to receive care or if you have to apply for, for public benefits, within that look back period, which here in Minnesota, it's that five year look back period, then that's where there, there can be issues and sort of ineligibility. And so it's that window, you know, as a 40 yes. something year old, it's, you know, you're not really planning a little for early, it. but if you're 88, yeah. you might've also missed that window, you, you know, you might've in five years doesn't sound like a long time, but it's, oh, it is okay. kind of a long time when you're talking about some of these, you know, especially when it comes to some of the very, um, the very basic um, kind of unfortunately often used tactics of let's just put the house in my daughter's oh, name and then yes. gift yeah. all of my assets away and and hopefully get past five years. But a lot of stuff can happen in five years to your kids who now have all of your assets who yes. could themselves get sued and lose all of the money that was intended yes. for your health care. So it, yes. it's a very convoluted oh, yeah. um, area of planning you have to be careful oh. with. Yes. And you need to really plan ahead for it. Yeah. Well, and not to sort of open a whole other can of worms, but then it's the clients too that have to understand what is that, you know, that you're, you're gifting and getting out of your estate. Um, and this happens also when we're planning from an estate tax planning side, when people say, oh, I want to gift all these assets out of my estate so that, you know, I'm not going to pay estate tax. When you gift, you are potentially causing issues with capital gains tax. And so then you start to have to deal with, you know, okay, well, yeah, the estate tax might not be so bad. Um, Your capital gains tax is actually going to be worse. And that is something we're starting to see and do a bit more where, you know, some of that tax planning after a spouse had passed away was implemented 
but now that widow has survived, you know, maybe 20 years. And now we're saying, oh gosh, you know, when they pass away, we actually might be worse off with this capital gains exposure than we would be with the estate tax. That's right. Um, Exactly. This, this is, this is a fantastic, like kind of, uh, area of planning we could go down for a while yeah. but i i, I think yeah. the maybe the takeaway is that uh, just you know don't make knee-jerk reactions thinking you're trying to solve one problem yeah. and ultimately create three other problems yes. and and so it's a the, the whole financial yeah. planning and estate planning and tax planning it's a giant yeah. puzzle that you yeah. have to just kind of build from the outside edges in and yes. um, every piece you move might change the other piece. So I know very good, yeah. very good information, Jen. I always love talking to you. Yes, um, of course. We might have to have you come of back course. on some yes. other time. We'll pick one of these topics. Yes. Um, you yeah. know, Bill, I think we're gonna we're gonna kind of wrap it up there. And 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 I want to just put this message out to listeners that you know, if you found something pretty interesting about our topic today, um, let us know because we yeah. I actually have an email. Um, MWA uh, podcast at focusfinancial.com. And I'd love to hear if there's a certain aspect of this that was more interesting, and then we could delve into it a little mm-hmm. bit more. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's a great idea, Matt, uh, because there, there are a lot of things that y'all touched on. And uh, mercifully, from a listener point of view, you stayed a lot out of the weeds here. You, you, <laughs> you, you gave us a nice, good, clean yeah. overview of what we should be thinking about. Jen, thank you very much. That That was... You made that very listenable. And, uh, you know, it's an uncomfortable topic, as Matt mentioned in the first episode. A lot of people don't want to think about this stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, but. You, you know, you take... feel a lot better when you do talk mm-hmm. about it at yeah. the end, when it's all wrapped up. And, you know, I often see, uh, you know, a, a trigger might be someone going on a long vacation. They're, mm-hmm. they're hey, we're, we're retired now. We're going to do the round the world, you know, cruise. Yeah. And this whole thing's just weighing over them. So just get it, get it out of the way ahead of time. You'll just feel so much better. Now, I know that both of your contact informations are in the show notes, but, but, but Matt, uh, you want to give us Jen's contact and, and then share with us yours as well. Well, Jennifer, yes. um, I, I want you to give your, your um, website address again. Yes. Cause again, I think it sure. sounds so exotic when you bring it up, the name <laughs> of the firm. Yes, it's so it's Sakura Santini.com and that's S Y K O R A S A N T I N I dot com. And are you on LinkedIn and other social we media are. outlets as well? Yes. We probably are not as good, probably as you are, truthfully, but we are on on all of them. Okay, great. We'll put yeah. that in the show notes as well. And you can of course uh, you know, visit our website at perspective six group.com, the number six. And uh, check out, we we do have some estate planning articles there as well. We'll link to the um, to the various uh, places how to contact Jen in the show notes. You can find the show notes out on our website. Um, you can also give us a call if you want to chat, have a second opinion, or get in touch with Jen. So my number is 952-225-0333. And uh, yes, until, until next time. Well, you know, until next time, those of you who are listening, if you have an idea about something you would like to hear Matt address in these podcasts, reach out and get in touch with him, as well as if you have any questions about the issues of estate planning that have come up in the past two episodes, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love the opportunity to address those questions and give you some answers, as a matter of fact. For those of you who are regular listeners, thanks for listening. For those of you who are listening who are not yet subscribers, well, this is easy. (laughs) You hit subscribe. Uh, That's all you have to do. You can hit subscribe, and then you don't have to think of it and where or whatever about who was that guy and when did I hear it. You will automatically be notified when Matt puts out a new edition of the MedTech Wealth Advisor. It's really that simple. We'd also ask that if you've would write it and share it. Let people know about what man is talking about here and how you find it helpful to listen. Until next time, on behalf of Matt and everybody at Perspective Six, I'm Bill Tucker, thanking you for listening and reminding you that you do have an opportunity today to go out and make it a great day. Or not. It is your choice. Until next time.